meetings of uh, the slow news days um which are run by by slow news uh, which is uh, this italian uh, um newspaper with a um a sort of a strange business model which is called the uh, uh, pay how much as you can and um how our guest uh, today is uh, steve harrison um and uh, i think that uh, it could be very significant to tell to tell you the story um of uh, how uh, i met uh, steve uh, virtually because we never met uh, in the physical world um uh, we uh, at one point in my life i found this uh, this book i don't know if you can see it um this book is called uh, uh, changing the world is the only fit work for a grand man and um i was very interested in it because uh, because of the title most of all and because i was very curious about this um um this uh, howard luke gossage um because i've heard something about him uh, but i've never read anything about him and uh, since my english is not so good i had to to read it twice very slowly and the second time i i i've read it i i figured out that uh, at the end of the book there is this page that oh we can see you steve now hey cool hi <laughs> hello thank goodness <laughs> so we can see you in two way in the picture and uh, on your yes. camera. Yes, hang on, there oh. I am. Yeah, this is I'm the last page. My, I'll just get a book. I'm, I'm, now you can see me. I'm going to get something. Okay, <laughs> so um, this is the last page of the book, and um, as you can see in the last page, uh, there is an email, a Google mail, by the way, uh, and um, and the Steve say uh, and the. the, the um, the, the page about the author say, like Howard Luke Gossage, he always encouraged people to respond to his work and would be delighted if you email him and the email and so on. And so I, I took the, the suggestion and uh, I wrote to Steve and uh, surprisingly, he, he answered me. Surprising because in Italy we're not so used to, to receive uh, this kind of uh, feedbacks. And since uh, uh, all the book and all the story that we are tell, um, telling today is about feedbacks. I think it's a perfect story to to introduce uh, um, you, Steve, and to let you explain um, to let you explain us, to let you explain the audience uh, what does it mean to be truly interested in feedbacks by by people. Um, well, thank thank you. Anish, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you. I'm very honoured. Uh, I have a huge amount of respect for what you and the, your fellow workers and colleagues and uh, people who are sympathetic to your cause are trying to do. Um, so it's an honour for me and I hope I can be of some use to you. Um, you. As, as far as the feedback thing is concerned, I always, I've written five books now and every on every one of them, I always put my email address in order to ask for people to get back to me and tell me what they think about the book. Um, and I think it's important to do that because it, it reminds me, it keeps me constantly aware of the fact that there is a reader at the other end of what I'm writing. So there's a sense that I'm always writing for somebody that you never get lost in your own self-indulgences, you never get lost in your own, you know, kind of agendas. You must realize there's always someone at the other end. Um, I think as writers, as an advertising writer, uh, you, we always had a saying, I can't write to everybody, I can only write to somebody. So it's very useful to always have a sense that you're writing to somebody. And I always say that good writing is conversational and you write as you speak and you write as you would speak to that person if you were concentrating very hard on the conversation that you were having with them and it is a conversation you know you have got to constantly think is this person interested am i saying something interesting or am i saying something that just interests me you know kind of um and so the whole the whole idea about having my having the get have, creating a feedback loop is so that people can talk back to remind keep me conscious of the fact i'm always writing to somebody and give them the chance to write back and say i don't agree with you or how could this be or what do you mean how do you there's you know kind of I'm pointing out some of the many paradoxes and inconsistencies in my writing you know kind of um 
So it's to, it's to encourage a discussion rather than me just broadcasting. I, I don't, as an advertising person, I don't like the idea of broadcast, you know, and I like the idea of interaction. And I think this, I think if journalists held that in their heads as well, that there's somebody at the end of this and every sentence, every paragraph I write, they will stop, they have every opportunity to stop reading at the end of every paragraph and keeping them going and going and going is very difficult. And it's a great lesson and, and advice for journalists because uh, uh, we are often um, used to, to have monologues and not yeah. dialogues. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's the reason why in a situation where we, when we are talking about journalism, I, I invited you. Yeah. Even because um, I'd like to, to explain uh, the audience uh, um, what, what does it mean that uh, um, you are a, a great fan of uh, this man, Howard Gossage. What yeah. does it mean that this, who, who was him? And why do you say that uh, he anticipated the Facebook and Zuckerberg even 20 years before uh, Zuckerberg uh, was born? Well, I think that um, Howard Gossage, I first came across Howard Gossage in 1988 with, um, can you see that? This book. Um, and it's called Is there any hope for advertising? Yes, it's the Gossage book, but it's re repurposed re with a wraparound. But this was the original yeah. in 1988. And is there any hope? And I just saw this book, Is There Any Hope for Advertising? And I was, um, advertising is really good at post-rationalizing. If you've been successful in your advertising, then you post-rationalize why it was successful. You never, no one knows why it was successful. Or very few people, you post-rationalize the success. We're very good at looking to the future, looking at the next bandwagon, which will be rolling by, which we can all jump on. But we're terrible at introspection. And I said, I imagine the same thing is with journalism, that we're terrible at looking at ourselves and saying where our failings are. You know, how are we delivering on our mission? You know, kind of how much of what we write is actually ingested, taken on board, read, and how much of it is just yesterday's, tomorrow's fish and chip papers, as we say in England. Um, and so Howard, Howard, Howard was a terrible critic of our industry, and it was so refreshing to read somebody um, who was critical of what we did. But... The important thing about Howard was, and again, this probably applies to journalism, and you'll see the distinction. Howard was an intellectual who happened to work in advertising and not an advertising man who was an intellectual. And I'm sure you know the difference. There are journalists who are intellectuals, but there are also intellectuals who just happen to be journalists. And so the intellectual who happens to be a journalist sees journalism as just another part of the, of the media echo sphere. And then and just as Howard did, that Howard was an intellectual who worked in advertising and Howard saw advertising as just another part of the news media. Of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, we did, we did, he didn't call it echo sphere. In fact, I have difficult, I have, I'm uncomfortable using such jargon, but yes, it, it, he, he saw advertising as just another form of the communications, range of communications, which people were absorbing or were trying to get people's attention. Uh, and so he looked beyond advertising to find ways to improve it. And the first thing he did, if you don't mind me say, It, it, it was he hit he, he he adopted an idea an idea a theory a way of living a way of working which were which was pioneered by a german uh, mathematician called norbert wiener and norbert wiener may not mean too much to your to the people who are tuning in but if any of them have asked for feedback this week or if any of them have talked about getting in the loop with people, then they are using terminology which is straight out of the cybernetics playbook, okay? Because cybernetics is a theory, a way of working, a way of thinking, a way of communicating, whereby you create a loop which provides continuous feedback, continuous information to either the person or the machine that is in that loop And that constant continuous feedback of information allows that machine or that person to improve their performance or their behavior if they take that feedback on board. And that was 
the, that, that is cybernetics. And it was a massively popular, influential theory in post-war America and post-war Europe. Uh, cybernetics thinking informed computer science, anthropology, uh, the circuitry. I'm in my kitchen, right? Um, the, um, and the kettle over there has got a it, it has got a, a circuit board which is based upon cybernetics. Our microwave has got a circuit board based upon cybernetics feedback loops. Um, so the whole consumer goods revolution was in, was was facilitated by Weiner's work on cybernetics. There's also as, a, as an aside which you'll appreciate an obscure Canadian professor working at the University of Toronto also changed his views and his uh, theories as a result of reading Norbert Weiner. Um, and I, you, you, I think you might have heard of him. He was called Marshall McLuhan. So he was very, so, so Weiner was very influential guy, very influential guy. And what, and what appealed to Howard about him was his communications theory. And again, I think this applies today as much as it, the, the, the standard theory of communication is that I have an idea. I write it as a piece of journalism or I write it as an advertisement. I find a medium that projects this, that broadcasts this to a receiver who then changes their views as a result of what I've written. So it's sender, message, medium, receiver motion that's, that's basically the, the the theory that has informed you know community you know kind of advertising and i imagine journalism you know kind of that's classic theory what what weiner introduced or what gossage adopted was the idea that i send you a message you respond to me having received that message my next message changes to take on board your point of view and we go back to get we go forward together in this interactive uh, relationship and that is what howard hit upon like 30 40 years before anyone started talking about interactive advertising interactive advertising which which was made possible by internet 2.0 but howard was doing this in 1960 <laughs> and uh when I when I read your book the first time, I I couldn't believe about the the part of the story about Marshall McLuhan. Yeah. Because of yeah. course I, I knew him, but I I've never uh, guessed that uh, Howard Gossage was behind him in some way. Well, wait, what, I'm going to I'm going to get with? another book. I'll be one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Lui ha un solo libro tradotto in italiano sulla creatività. Intitola Come fare lavori creativi migliori. I first came across this. I'm a great I was a, a, talking about slow journalism. I, oh, yeah. I, from the 1970s I just loved this guy. You know, kind of, and this was this was this was red hot journalism, you know, the way that Tom Tom wrote, but it was slow, long, long, long form pieces, you know, kind of, um, I mean, I'm, I, I've written my latest book, uh, Can't Sell, Won't Sell. I had in my mind a book Tom Wolfe wrote called The Painted Word, which is a critique of the New York art scene in the 1970s, you know, kind of 40,000 words, 45,000 word essay. Anyway, this is how I discovered Marshall McLuhan and Gossage. Tom Wolfe wrote all about it you know, kind of in one, in, in one of the essays in here. So yeah, so Goss Gossage discovered McLuhan and then promoted him through, to, in, through his connections in the media, in TV, in radio, and took this obscure professor with his weird, you know, very difficult, dense, obscure theories and made him into one of the most, you know, famous, TV celebrities, media celebrities, acad academic celebrities of the late 60s and early 70s. And probably you would not have heard of McLuhan had it not been for, neither I wouldn't, we, neither of us would have heard of McLuhan had it not been for, for Howard Gossage. And in some way he, he was creating uh, platforms 
around the brands or people or or causes that uh, he wanted to promote it. Uh, so, yes, for example, yes. with uh, with Melu, McLuhan, he invited the journalists to to listen to him, yeah. and then he he took this idea to an extreme level about uh, uh, ambiental and uh, environmental causes like uh, the Grand Canyon history. Yeah. So, yeah. can he, you tell can you tell us the story? Well, I can, but I, I'll give you this, the, the theory behind it, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. You have to know that that um, Howard was, as I say, he he looked upon he looked outside of advertising to find ways of improving it. Um, and his next after after Weiner, he then used this guy. Uh, can you see it? A book called The Image by Just Daniel J. Borstead. Okay. The image by Dan and it was a bestseller in 1961. Listen to this. This is just like so. It's uh, it's about pseudo events. A pseudo event. Daniel J. Boston said was all of these synthetic happenings which were flooding the media, which blurred the line between real news and and what he called pseudo events, but what we now call marketing, marketing spin or fake news. And this was in 1961, this guy, listen to this. this. This is what a pseudo event is. It is planted primarily, not always exclusively, but primarily for the immediate purpose of being reported or reproduced. Right, so this story is planted primarily for the immediate purpose of being reported or reproduced. Therefore, its occurrence is arranged for the convenience of the reporting or reproducing media. Its success is measured by how widely it is reported. The question, is it real, is less important than, is it newsworthy? <laughs> Which I think is dynamite in 1961. Yeah. It, the question, is it real, is less important than is it newsworthy? So Howard, right, I have got all of Howard's correspondence with Barrows Mussey here, which um, oh my God. <laughs> every, all the letters that he wrote throughout the 1960s. And there's one that he wrote to Barrows Mussey, and no one, he never went public with this. You won't see his, his this stuff in the Book of Gossage because he knew it was just too... It was just too um, too smart, you know. It was his big advantage. He said, "It took me a long time to discover just what the formula was. It is apparently this: that you set forth a platform on a given project and have it exactly right, word for word, through an ad, and then pursue this matter with press conferences and so forth with publicity." I am the only practitioner I know who does it on purpose, and I don't do it as often as I would like. So that's Howard going, I've hit upon this great idea. What we do is we, the advertising is just the start of a media campaign which uses the news, the radio, the TV, the newspapers to amplify the message. So you pay a small amount of money for your advertising, but you, if it's newsworthy enough, you, let, you get all of this earned, it's called earned media now. You know, kind of, you don't pay for it, you know, kind of. And then you get the message amplified out to the world. And he was the first person, the first ad man to realize that the advertising was just the start of the process. And um, how, do you, how did you put in practice this lesson in your work as an advertiser? Well, I'll for give example, you, you, you told me, yeah, please. Well, Howard, Howard did it. Howard did it. Very, he did it with McLuhan. He didn't even bother doing an ad with McLuhan. He just went straight to the newspapers with Marshall McLuhan. He went to straight to the news, the TV studios, and whatever. Um, his most famous usage of it was when the the U.S. government was that far away from building a dam across the Grand Canyon. Okay, so the the most magnificent geographical geological you know, phenomena in the United States was going to be damned, you know, kind of, and, and, um, and, and the, it was, it had been, they'd been fight, the conservationists had been fighting it for five years. Um, and it, it was about to go through Congress until one last, they took one last chance. They, they went to Howard Gossage and said, can you just write a press ad about this? And so he wrote a press ad 
which I think I have here. Yeah. Here. And it says, now only you can save the Grand Canyon from being flooded. Okay, for profit. And it's the brilliant thing that he did here was he put coupons down the side of the ad. Can you see it? Coop, a coupon, a coupon. Yeah. This was right to your senator, right to your congressman. Okay. And tell him that you are outraged that this is happening. And so this was in the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc. And so what he created was a feedback loop. Okay, an information loop, which had the congressmen and the senators in with the people who were complaining about it. So the protesters were now in the loop with the people who had the power to do something about it. And so, and, and so they, 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 apparently Washington was bombarded with these coupons, these letters from people saying, we, we don't agree with, we, we, et cetera. But this, the secret was that Howard also suggested somewhere down here in the body copy, that damming the Grand Canyon would create a lake at 350 miles long, which and wasn't true. It was a fake news, yeah. <laughs> it was fake news, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the experts said this is rubbish, you know. Some people said it was possible, but a lot of the experts said this was not going to happen. But it was precisely the kind of sensational piece of information that Howard knew would go but you know, kind of would go would, would be viral. You know, it was viral. Viral, yeah. Um, and did you do the same in your work? You you told me the I, story of the World Gold Council and the uh, yeah, I did. Well, we didn't lie for the World Gold Council. <laughs> lie has yes, we we told the truth with the World Gold Council. The uh, the British government. Um, don't even ask why. We we were sitting on. One, I think it was the sixth biggest pile of gold reserves in the world, the UK government, you know, kind of, we had, a, we had, the, it's the national wealth in gold, our sovereign wealth fund was in gold. And the government decided they would sell half of our gold su supply off for dollars, euro and yen. And there was no debate about this in the House of Commons, in the parliament. This had been kind of like snuck through this had been secretly put through and there'd been no debate about it and the world gold council came to my agency and said you need to draw attention to this we need to get people talking about this this needs to be debated you know and we said how much money have you got and they said uh, ten thousand pounds and they, i said and we said well your target audience is the people in the house of commons and the parliamentarians but we need something bigger than that so what we did is we on the river thames since romans that you'll see barges traveling down carrying rubbish garbage from the towns out down to the river estuary and dumped basically in the north in the north sea or not nowadays but that was always the you know it would be garbage rubbish down, you know old but these ancient barges traveling down the river thames so what we did was we we got we hired a barge, but we filled it with cars, fridges, microwaves, you know, kind of old stuff. But we painted it all gold, and then we floated <laughs> it down the River Thames. And we and we we took this barge outside the river, outside the Houses of Parliament here. So you can see from the photograph here that this is the House of Commons. This is the there the, the, there is a a balcony here where they come out the, the members of parliament come out for their gin and tonics at lunchtime and so we <laughs> took this thing out and it just says precious metals at giveaway prices gordon brown and gordon brown gordon brown was our chancellor in those days and we just moored it outside and then we we rang the newspapers up and uh, as you can see here this is the this is the financial times and this is the gold at 20 year low after uk sale um so and then we were uh, i think i sent you the link that we were on tv on the hour every hour with like a 60 second uh, news footage of the of the guy outside the house of commons so that that i think was a an example of the ad platform technique that this is our advertisement you know and then we let the media 
amplify that message to uh, and and with I mean that's the paper you wanted to be in as well. The Financial Times is our <laughs> you know business you know kind of serious yeah. newspaper or or says it is anyway. So that was an example. Uh, okay, of the I have to admit. Hmm? Yeah, I have to admit that uh, when I when I listen to this story and to the other ones. I'm a little bit worried as a journalist because it seems that uh, the media ecosystem is so weak and yes. basically you can manipulate it. You can create this pseudo event yeah. and uh, or, or, or real facts, but isn't it very dangerous if, you, if the cause that you're trying to, uh, to amplify is not, is not so good? Of course, of course. I, I think there was a very good example. I, I think a very good example of that is um, whether it's a good, I, I think it's a, I, well, uh, yeah, I think there's a good example. I saw a good example a couple of weeks ago. I was reading the Financial Times Weekend magazine. Um, and they, they, they do a bit of, I mean, it's reasonably slow journalism, but they have a full page lunch you know, full full page. Uh, it's a leisurely lunch interview with a particular, you know, kind of media figure that week. And in this case, they were in. They they were in. They <coughs> in this case, they were interviewing Opal Tomatai, who is one of the founders, one of the three founders of Black Lives Matter. And they were discussing with her the 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 Black Lives Matters um, advocacy of defunding the police mm -hmm. right so uh, one of the main platforms of blm's uh, ag uh, on that agenda is the defunding of the police to take the money away from the police um in actual fact as the journalist points out it, it it's more accurate to say that they want the funds reallocated, that they're not just going to take the money away from the police, they want to reallocate the funds to social workers and sociologists and community groups who would then address the problem. And I think that's perfectly, I think that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion. And they said, do you not think that this is, that saying defunding the police, stripping the money away from the police is inflammatory, you know, kind of, uh, and, and she said, she said um, she spaces her words carefully, eager to defend the shock value of the slogan "Defund the Police." Uh, but she says it is. It, yeah, it may seem polarizing, but what what's beneath all of it is an invitation to examine what does safety look like. It gets people thinking more rigor rigorously about what's going on. So misleading people with that statement is justified because it gets people thinking about what is going on you know kind of so it is a it is a manipulation of the truth in order to cause the shock value that black lives matter feel is necessary in order to make the changes that they that they that they want but it isn't an accurate description of what it is their policy is huh. and that is the financial times you know kind of so and they didn't press them on it they didn't press them on it. They accepted that explanation, um, and um, so I, as a good as a journalist, you would have pursued that, I think. But you know, kind of. Um, so yes, everybody's the ev all even the most. I mean, you say even the most respectable newspapers, especially the most uh, respected <laughs> newspapers. Yeah, we can, we can be so easily manipulated. Uh, and so, um, in, in such um, a polarized reality, uh, we are living in this uh, in this polarized reality. So you are in the UK, which yeah. is probably one of the most polarized country right now due to the yeah. Brexit. Yeah. How can how can you truly be interested in in people who are not thinking the same that you are thinking? I mean, um, last week I was having a lesson with my students. And uh, we were talking about people that think that uh, the earth is flat, and they right. they were they yeah they were blaming them no oh haha -ha. uh, and the, um, I was uh, provoking them uh, uh, and I was telling them okay but do you blame anyone um, 
who thinks strange things that you are not agree that you don't agree with and so the question is how i i know that you can't talk to everybody but yeah. how can you talk to someone which is the opposite of what you think yeah i think that it's um uh, but it's it's i think it's a problem for the makeup of those who are making the news i mean we do live in the united kingdom in a in a in a bubble um we have a media a a, a, a middle class elite metropolitan bubble which is responsible for pretty much all of our our uh, creative industries um our academic institutions not responsible but but has a disproportionate share of the power over or over our creative industries which i i uh, i would is journal uh, the media um uh, academia um the government quangos uh, the charitable institutions we have uh, so our our lives are pretty much um uh, the, the the power and influence is held by people who have no diversity of opinion they have diversity of origin they may be of diverse ethnic uh, uh religious um uh, national origin but there is very little diversity of opinion um so that most people in order to get on in those milieu have got to conform to the group think orthodox progressive liberal left view of the world and the sense of social justice that that seem that 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 that, that seems to be the the goal to be achieved um so i think that that uh, the aim is to create a diversity of opinion and a diversity of prejudice so that you share the office with somebody who actually disagrees quite diamet diametrically to you um, and and so you you should create work eco structures in which you have a diversity of opinion uh, so that you're not simply reinforcing and reassuring each other every time you come up with a with a with a view um, it's very difficult i mean i live in you know kind of in, in the world in the milieu in which i live it's very difficult to meet people who do in london this is who do not all share the same mindset. You know, I'm fortunate in that I travel back up to the north of England regularly to see my fam my mother, and it's a different country. As I'm sure, you know, it, 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 the same situation obtains in, in, in Italy, I'm sure. You know, kind of, you, you, if you spend all of your time in Milan, what the hell do you know yeah. is, is happening in Puglia? You know, Bari or, you know, kind of, uh, down down in any any you know kind of anywhere south of rome basically and and in the environs it's not just a no it's not just a mezzogiorno it is it is it isn't just a north south divide with you it's it's in probably towns 60 miles outside of milan 50 miles outside of rome you know kind of the the the, the two the two italy's exist in mutual incomprehension And how, and how can we? I, I yeah, explained it as anywheres and somewheres. I think you 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 were interested in the theory of anywheres and somewheres. I think. Yeah, because this lead. Let let me tell uh, the, the audience. This lead to the last book of uh, Steve, uh, which I I've read this summer. Um, Can't sell, won't sell, and uh, I was amazed by the fact that. Uh, there is a quote by, in some way, the, the title is a quote by Dario Fo. Dario Fo, yeah. Uh, which I found it very funny. And, well, um, I, the only reason I used that was I said, it's, the, it's a very funny play. I said, but it's the only time you'll ever see the word funny and Marxist in the same sentence. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it's very interesting for me because it's um, a travel outside my, my bubble. And uh, yes, please explain us the, the concept of somewhere and anywhere. Um, it, 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 if you want to understand the, the terrible chaos in, uh, in the UK about Brexit, uh, this explains it, okay. Um, the, the, the anywheres, um, they, they, they 
constitute about 20% of the UK population, but they, they monopolize you know, 80% of all of the influential positions in, as I said, the creative industries, the academia, uh, the media, whatever. And that's, they, they are educate, university educated to a man and a woman, you know. So education is hugely important to them. They, they left home from wherever it was in the UK, went to university and never went back home, right? They gravitated towards London. They probably got a job with a multinational or they work with somebody who in a, in, a, in a multinational field. They probably have the intention of working abroad at some time. They feel totally comfortable with, this, with their metropolitan identity, okay? They relate to the outside world, okay? And they regard themselves as from anywhere, okay? And everyone you know, Alberto, is probably in anywhere, Yeah, you know? Uh, yeah. they, 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 they they relate you know you know you you feel as comfortable you 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 have more in common with me than you do with somebody in Puglia yeah probably yeah um so you know you know kind of uh, so but then there are the somewheres okay who constitute about 50% of the population and i think it's something like 80% of the you uh, i think it's 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 six i like 50 percent of the uk population are still living within 14 miles of where they were when they were 14 years of age okay and they are from somewhere they relate to and identify with the town that they were born in or brought up in the the, the neighborhood in which they were brought up in and this and the street in which they were brought up in and they they have roots and an identity that dates back generations okay so they are from somewhere okay now i've i've made the generalization that anywheres are humanitarian you know, kind of. You tell you know if there are if there are ref if if there's a refugees problem, you know, kind of. I'll go out and march about that. You know, I'm an anywhere. I'm I I will take that refugee problem to heart, and I'll go and march through London next week about it because I'm from anywhere, and their problem is my problem. If I'm a somewhere, I'm communitarian. So if the old lady across the street can't get out of lockdown and she can't go to the shops. I'll go and do a shopping for her. I'll go and do a gardening for her. Okay. So you have the humanitarian anywheres and you have the communitarian somewheres. And my other generalization is that anywheres like people in general, but somewheres like them in particular. So okay. anywheres like the whole idea of people generally. Oh, yes, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I, I care. I'm compassionate. But the somewheres actually like people in particular. They actually do things that 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 signify and rep and manifest their caring. So so the anywhere will march through London. The somewhere will walk across the street to help the neighbour. And how, how? Which is your advice? Is, uh, your, your advice? How can we take care of both of them? Can we cope um, with both of them? Well, this, this, the anywheres are taking care of themselves very well at the moment. You know, <laughs> kind of, um, they're fine. You know, they don't need your help, man. You know, kind of, their their voice is being heard disproportionately. Their voice is shouting down anybody who doesn't agree with them, and anyone who doesn't agree with them is stupid, ignorant, racist, bigoted, prejudiced. You know, kind of. Um, so they don't need your help. They're doing okay. They're the editors of every newspaper, magazine, TV show, whatever, you know, kind of in, in Italy. Certainly they are in the UK. Uh, it's the somewheres who need a voice. Um, and it, and, and it's, the, it's the somewheres who need understanding. And they need to be saved from the likes of Donald Trump and Mario Salvini. They need to be saved from these people. They don't need to be pilloried and ridiculed and ignored. They need someone to articulate their very serious and legitimate grievances about the way that life in Italy, the way that life in the United States and the way that life in the United Kingdom is treating them. 
and they don't need to be told, they don't need to be given lessons in ethics and morality. They don't need to be told that, you know, kind of that they're, that they're, they're guilty of, of in subconscious racism and they must start apologizing for that, that they're ruining the planet and they must start. They don't need someone sticking a finger in their chest, telling them that they're failed human beings. And that's what, what we are doing all the time. All the when time. We are yeah, we are doing yeah. that all the time. Yeah, we're bullying. When we are advocating for our causes. Yeah, because we have this sense of morality that is not theirs. You know, they've got, uh, if you read my book, Jonathan Haidt's Moral Foundation Theory, is that our, our liberal left morality is based upon indiv individualizing, which is social justice and caring, okay? We have got two foundations to our morality. The mainstream have got five foundations to the morality. They have the social justice and caring, but they also have an understanding of a res and a respect for authority, community, and and tradition. And they like those. And you know, and they're they're, they are balanced. We are unbalanced with our over over emphasis upon how much we care. So we need to understand them. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, we, we need, there needs to be more, it, it, the word is empathy. We need to be able to empathize. We need to see, we need to put aside, you know, kind of our 30, 40 years, my 60 years experience, you know, you know kind of, I'm, I'm in that bubble, you know, kind of, I've been successful in the bubble, but we need to set aside our own preoccupations and our own priorities and learn how to empathize with people who don't share them and they don't people who don't have our aspirations you know can we have a different set of aspirations to them and we need to start to understand them otherwise we lose them to to uh, politicians who 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 um who exploit those their feeling of frustration yeah, it's amazing that that's exactly what I was looking for because the first time I, I, I've met these concepts, it was for me a travel outside my bubble. So yeah. first of all, thank you so much. I'm all asking right. uh, the, the audience if they have any, any questions. Um, Rossella, um, Rossella wrote, Changing the World is the title of... Um, is the title of the book uh, changing the world is the only fit work for a grown man uh, the concept pervades the the advertising world in this last year uh, what is your vision of this process of changing do you think that uh, the advertising world uh, uh, I think, uh, Rossella, you mean, uh, Ro Rossella, vuoi dire il marketing con, che fa proprio le, le proprie cause, no? il purpose marketing when you are advocating as, a, as an advertiser too. What do you think about that? Me or, or who you, you. is this question named at? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a question by the audience. Oh, right. Uh, what is my view? I, I, I'm, I'm amazed you get, um, you get someone like this woman. Give me a second, it's clear. Yeah. There we go. This, this is from Unilever, okay. This is from Unilever, the, the big global multinational producer of 900 products, which has basically put every small grocery store and every small convenience store out of business, you know, kind of like it, it, with the supermarkets, you know, kind of, the, you're okay in Italy, you protect your local produce, you know, kind of, but in the UK, if you're a small producer, then the likes of Unilever have wiped you out, you know, kind of. Um, and this is, this is from uh, Aline Santos, who is the, the uh, where is she, 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 where is she? Where is she? Yeah, she's the executive pri vice president of global marketing at Unilever. Executive vice president of global marketing at Unilever. And she says, a brand's role in culture has never been more important because people expect us to have a point of view. 
This is the time when we can see businesses and brands as the biggest healers in our society and our planet. Businesses and brands as the biggest healers in our society and in our planet. We have to take that responsibility. No, they don't have to take that risk. No one wants them to take that responsibility. You know, kind of like, like, no, you do not have the right to take that responsibility. I do not need my moral compass to be set by somebody who makes ice cream and soap. You know, I do not need to be given lectures on, you know, kind of what, how I should live my life by, by Ben and Jerry, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very dangerous power grab by the likes of Procter and Gamble and by the likes of Unilever that they will now set themselves up as the arbiters between how we behave, what is moral behavior and what is immoral behavior with their social purpose messages. Okay. The robber barons in the United States at the turn of the 19th, 20th century in the Gilded Age were, were rightly condemned for their uh, avariciousness, but they would never have dreamed of trying to set our moral compass for us. And I think that it's about, and the, the antitrust laws that were introduced to break up the robber barons in, the, in America should be applied to the likes of Google, who are using their power to, to manipulate our data, and Unilever and Procter and Gamble, who are using their power to try and assume responsibility for our, for our, uh, for our values. It's very clear to me what, what you think about the purpose marketing and they put in this. When it works, if, if the purpose is aligned with what the product does, how it's yeah. positioned and the promise that it's making, fine. I love it. I think that it's absolutely right, you know, kind of. Um, but as with all so many times in advertising, we come up with very good theories and very good ideas. And then everyone jumps on the bandwagon because they're too bloody lazy to do their jobs. And, they, and it's an easy fix. Like the guy, the Gianni di Tondello, I think, the Heineken guy, who said, Millennium, millennials make my job so easy. I just come up with one message, you know, kind of millennials, they'll, and, you know, Heineken, the beer, saving the world. It's like, when, how, you know, but it's just lazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. It, uh, My pleasure. It, it's been very, very interesting to, to listen to to you, and I'd like to uh, to finish this uh, conversation because then we have to start the other one. It's an okay. it's a never ending days. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I'd like to show you this one. We started with a with a coupon and with the feedback and so on, and uh, in the, in the Great. third uh, in the last page of this book, which is actually uh, an, an old book i found this coupon okay yeah. and uh, of course uh, I, I wasn't sure if i had to to send it by ordinary mail or uh, or whatever and so I, I i googled and i found an email a very old email i wrote an email to get a gossage t-shirt and someone uh, answered me Oh. And and so <laughs> I've met just like uh, I've met you. I've met um, people who are running a, a, a very small publisher in the, in the US, and they still yeah. have this Gottage T-shirt, and they will right. send me one. Right. Are you wearing it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is this is definitely the the feedback loop in some way. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, always invite people to write back to you. You know, it 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 it, it enhances your experience. It enhances theirs. You know, it makes it richer. Steve, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Alberto. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank yeah, you, everybody. And, and thank you. Invite people to get in touch with me. Give, if anyone wants to write to me, you've got my email address, so I'll give it to them. Okay. Please. Thank you so much. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Thank you. God bless. Thank Ciao. You. Ciao.